the, what I want to talk about today is, um, it's a bit rambling uh, and sprawling, but we'll, we'll, we'll use the word ambitious, um, seeing as how we're being charitable at this stage of the semester. Uh, but really I want to talk about strategic confusion in health policy. Uh, and in particular, to begin to ask, why do we treat tobacco control so differently to other challenges in health policy? And I'm going to focus in uh, other areas of NCD policy in general, specifically with the contrast to, uh, to alcohol policy. Um, because one of the things that's striking to me is a, uh, the extent of reluctance to apply lessons learned from the perceived successes of tobacco control uh, to other areas of, of health policy. I think that um, really the core of tobacco control success has been taking conflict of interest seriously uh, and there's a marked reluctance um, for those lessons to be applied in other areas of, of health policy. That there's a uh, the strong presumption in favour of partnership between public and private sectors that characterises most areas of, um, of, of policy making around the world uh, is very problematic from a health policy perspective and I wanted um, to, to articulate um, some of that. Um, so if we start off with uh, just a couple of statements from, uh, from Margaret Chan, Director General of WHO, to illustrate that organisation's particular degree of strategic confusion about the terms of its interaction with the alcohol uh, industry. Um, so at the uh, World Health Promotion Conference in Helsinki uh, last year, um, Margaret Chan was presenting herself as a bit of a kind of scourge of, uh, of the industry uh, and very much drawing parallels between um, not just big tobacco, but big food, big soda and big alcohol, saying that all of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics, uh, and that therefore, in the view of WHO, the formulation of health policies must be protected from distortion by commercial or vested interests. But at the World Health Assembly, um, Margaret Chan spoke in very different terms, uh, much more muted terms, um, much more conciliar conciliatory terms, um, around not excluding cooperation with uh, industries other than tobacco that have a role to play in reducing the risk for NCDs uh, and making some, some really quite bizarre um, statements um, about alcohol being consumed at levels that don't harm health in some cultures. There wasn't much of an evidence base presented for that particular claim, but um, the, uh, the politics of, uh, of, of tackling the alcohol industry are, are very problematic and I want to, to, to touch on that this morning. Um, you know, we can use to perhaps thinking of tobacco and alcohol as rather different projects. When I've spoken to people in the Department of Health about this, the standard line is, ah, oh, yes, but you can use um, alcohol at safe levels in the way in which you, can, you can't for tobacco. Um, that would be contested by many people uh, in the alcohol community. But I think that the, the key point here is um, the very comparable levels of reliance of these industries on harmful levels of use. So it was recently calculated um, that around three quarters of the profitability of UK alcohol companies comes from harmful levels of alcohol use. If you've got an industry that's that dependent on harmful behaviours, the scope for shared interests between the commercial sector and public health I'd suggest is going to be fairly limited. Um, so what I want to talk about this morning is the idea uh, of policy coherence or rather of policy incoherence uh, in global health. Um, the idea of, uh, of, of policy coherence um, developed mostly in the context of, of talking about compatibility between trade and health policy um, objectives. So uh, Chantal Bluin described the extent to which conflicts between policy agendas are minimised and synergies maximised. And we can see some really stark contrasts across these three pillars um, of WHO strategy uh, for dealing with NCDs. On the one hand, we've got the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, uh, and on the other hand, with one or two minor differences, some, uh, 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 an emphasis uh, on collaborative approaches to addressing obesity uh, and alcohol. And it's alcohol I want to focus on um, this morning. I want to start by suggesting that really, you know, if we're serious about tackling NCDs, we have to understand them as industrial epidemics, um, and that effective uh, policies are likely to involve um, uh, regulating uh, industries in ways which are grounded on a recognition of conflict of interest and I'll position that as what I think has been the key to tobacco control's comparative success. I want to explore this in the context um, of, of thinking about um, 
uh, ambitious approaches to global health strategies. The, the UK government in 2008 produced what it described as the world's first attempt to develop a coordinated approach to global health across departments. And I want to use the issue of alcohol to illustrate the difficulties of achieving coherence in governmental approaches um, to uh, tobacco. I want to suggest that health strategies at national uh, and international levels um, have been uh, blind to these kind of dimensions. And to begin a bit more optimistically, uh, to, uh, to explore ways in which governments might be able to, uh, to still promote health goals or think about promoting health goals when these come into conflict with trade objectives and the goals of key economic actors. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, I th I, the starting point, the, the, um, the basic assumption of this essay is that NCDs should uh, be understood as industrial epidemics. The idea is taken by, uh, from Jahil and Barber. Um, uh, and the real value of this is that it shifts the, the policy focus and it shifts interventions uh, away from the agent, alcohol, or the host ideas of the problem drinker towards the disease vector, um, the alcohol industry and its associates. Uh, and it identifies diseases associated both with commercialization of dangerous products and also perhaps broader consumption of commercial products. Um, we can see corporate activities as driving epidemics in diverse ways, so generational epidemics, the need of companies to, um, to generate new drinkers or new smokers um, to replace older cohorts. We can think of targeted epidemics about particular social groups um, being, being targeted by companies. And, and perhaps most importantly, in a global health context of transnational epidemics, of the need for, uh, for companies to explore new markets uh, to, uh, to increase their profitability. And I want to focus on that in the context of, uh, of the alcohol industry. The starting point for this is that public health isn't really any different from most other areas um, of, of public policy uh, in the extent to which um, the uh, institution that's most important to the daily lives is, as J.K. Uh, Galbraith said back in 1977, uh, the one that we least understand, or more correctly, seek most elaborately to misunderstand. Uh, that's the modern corporation. And I think public health is particularly guilty of elaborately seeking to misunderstand. Um, this isn't an anti-corporate rant. I've got no problem, really, with what uh, corporations are doing. They're, they're doing... Uh, they're fulfilling fiduciary responsibility to stakeholders, generally behaving in ways in which uh, they uh, are predicted and are supposed to act. You know, we live in market economies. The key job uh, of corporations is to generate profitability, to generate jobs. Um, uh, my problem is the, the way in which public health uh, confers ambitions on the commercial sector that are unrealistic and we can't really expect them uh, to meet. So in this, if not many other ways, I would liken myself to Milton Friedman in suggesting that the businesses only have one social responsibility, uh, to use their resources, engage in activities designed to increase their profits. Um, what's really interesting about tobacco control uh, in this context is the way in which it's so different from, um, from the way in which we proceed in other areas uh, of activity. The, uh, my favourite way of depicting this, I've, I've come in recent years to talk about tobacco exceptionalism, um, about the, the way in which tobacco is presented as uniquely different to other areas of activity. The, um, the, the, the best single encapsulation of this is a, uh, a statement by the WHO Committee of Experts in 2000, ahead of the Freeman Convention on Tobacco Control, uh, when they said tobacco use is unlike other threats to global health. Infectious diseases don't employ multinational public relations firms. There are no front groups to promote the spread of cholera. Mosquitoes have no lobbyists. And the idea connotes both that tobacco is an exceptional product, i.e. uniquely harmful, but also I think um, it, it carries implications of exceptional conduct by the tobacco industry, depicting it as a, a pariah industry that behaves rather differently from other um, commercial sectors. Um, suggesting that tensions with public health are therefore irreconcilable and provides a logic for this industry being uh, uniquely um, regulated. Uh, and I'd question the extent to, to which any of these claims are, uh, are unique. You know, if we look at this quote, um, infectious diseases don't employ multinational public relations firms, but Nestle certainly does. There are no front groups to promote the spread of cholera, um, but there are plenty of front groups uh, promoting alcohol um, around the world. Um, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, uh, on the, my other kind of perhaps a slightly more questionable uh, claim is that tobacco control success uh, isn't based so much on specific interventions but on its general approach um, to policy and that 
Um, all interventions within tobacco control, all effective interventions within tobacco control, are ultimately grounded on a recognition of conflicting interests. Um, so the emphasis here isn't so much on you know, what particular uh, exceptions may or may not exist in smoke-free legislation. Um, here the, the emphasis is much more on the approach to policy making. Firstly, that partnership is precluded. It's not seen as legitimate for governments um, to develop policy in conjunction with tobacco companies in the same way in which obesity and alcohol pol um, com uh, uh, policies are developed in conjunction with alcohol and food companies. Um, interactions are minimised and regulated. Voluntary regulation, you know, relying on corporate social responsibility initiatives to achieve social goals isn't seen um, as sufficient. Research funding relationships for academics are rejected. Um, uh, and I, I think that the, the sum total of all of these different assumptions about how we go about tobacco control um, serve perhaps to make it rather easier for health objectives to prevail over other goals. You know, I, I was struck recently by the uh, th those of you who followed the story of plain packaging uh, in England and how the government uh, stepped back uh, from a commitment to introduce plain packaging uh, and have now essentially been forced to retreat. Uh, it struck me again that tobacco control is just remarkable for its capacity to defeat governments. If plain packaging is introduced, this will essentially be a defeat for the government in the same way as which smoke-free legislation was a defeat for the Blair government in which uh, formally the introduction um, of a comprehensive advertising ban was a defeat for the Blair government. This is a level of legislative achievement against formal government policy. That, that's just astonishing. It doesn't happen in other areas um, of, of, of public policy, certainly not in other areas of health policy. Um, we, we can see this playing out in a WHO uh, context where, again, you know, WHO's conception of tobacco control is predicated on a recognition uh, of conflict of interest, here defined by uh, by Lisa Biro as existing when an individual's secondary interests, such as personal financial interests, interfere with or influence judgments regarding the individual's primary interests, such as patient welfare, education, or research integrity. Uh, and we see, can see these playing out in, in all sorts of areas of activity of WHO, such as uh, guidelines for declaration of interests by WHO experts, when again, the tobacco industry is treated very differently to any other areas of commercial links that, um, that their experts may have. Um, and it, it's come, summed up in a, a statement that when tobacco control succeeds, the tobacco industry fails. There's a, a, a basic kind of polarisation uh, of logic here, which receives um, a really striking formulation in the context of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, an international public health treaty negotiated by the World Health Organisation. Um, uh, and much the most, I think, exciting provision uh, an important provision within that, um, and I suspect Ishan will, will agree with this, uh, is Article 5.3, um, which commits parties to protecting policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. So this international treaty commits um, parties to it, it's WHO member states, uh, to preclude, um, or to keep the tobacco industry out of policy making. That's a, that's a really big radical claim. What's striking about tobacco control is that it doesn't seem that radical a claim in the context of, of the tobacco industry. Um, but it, in terms of how we, uh, we are asking governments to act, um, it, it, it is uh, it, it's, you know, a, a really radical questioning of the, the usual way in which governance operates. Um, it's the only international convention to explicitly address the dangers of an industry subverting its object and purpose. Uh, and it's a challenge, as I say, to, to basic norms of, of governance. Um, uh, governance here meaning the process of decision making and the process by which decisions are implemented uh, or not implemented. And, and how we usually think of as, as good governance emphasises participation, emphasises the pursuit of consensus, emphasises being open to all stakeholders. Here we're seeing that in a major area of, uh, of, of economic and social activity, there's a key interest that should be precluded from the policy process. That's a big challenge to how... Um, how, how governance usually happens. Um, there, actually, the record of implementation uh, on 5.3 isn't quite as impressive as the language of the text might, uh, might suggest. Um, uh, but there are a number of, of governments which have uh, sought to, to take it semi-seriously, at least, including um, the, the British <coughs> government. So uh, the Tobacco Control Plan for England has a chapter which is essentially devoted to, to Article 5.3. But again, we might want to recognise here um, the importance of the exceptions, so uh, they will still dis discuss with industry operational matters around, uh, around smuggling 
uh, and, around, uh, and around tax. But again, this is very, very different um, from WHO's strategy in relation to alcohol uh, companies, where um, uh, the WHO Global Alcohol Strategy, um, its development included consultation meetings with uh, the alcohol industry, included participation from them, uh, and the strategy itself recognises that economic operators have important players, uh, are important players in their role as developers, producers, distributors, marketers and sellers of alcoholic beverages. They're especially encouraged to consider effective ways to prevent and reduce harmful use of alcohol within their core roles mentioned above, including self-regulatory actions and initiatives. It's inconceivable that WHO could produce a document in which the tobacco industry is spoken of in these kind of terms. Um, if we look uh, closer to home, um, uh, 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 again, uh, England's public health strategy uh, under the coalition government um, is, uh, is predicated on collaboration um, with the alcohol and food companies, though very explicitly not with tobacco companies. So the public health responsibility deal centres on the idea of working with industry and other partners to promote healthy living, uh, aiming to make voluntary approaches work before resorting um, to regulation. Uh, and so this includes, a, there's a whole series of, of companies who've made commitments under the public health responsibility deal. Uh, and in this context, I'd like to look at, at Diageo, um, who have committed to a number of things. Sorry, this is a dreadful slide. My IT skills didn't extend to making it legible. Uh, but this includes uh, a commitment to producing booklets and materials, new resources and films, alongside face-to-face -face training sessions, new online training package, distance learning packages, etc. Uh, materials and courses will be CPD accredited by the Royal College of Midwives and offered free to at least 10,000 midwives who we expect to inform over a million pregnant women of the risks of drinking alcohol in pregnancy by the end of 2014. Great. I really think a whiskey company are the people to take these on. Um, uh, which raises some interesting questions. Um, do we, uh, as a country... Uh, and a country is obviously very relevant in a Scottish sense as well as a, a British sense here. Treat Diageo um, as a national champion, uh, one of the very few industries in which either Scotland or the UK uh, can have uh, can claim to, ha to global leadership. Actually, tobacco is one of the few others. Um, uh, but it, it poses some really interesting questions about what we do. I think really interesting in the context of the independence debate in Scotland at the moment as well. So Diageo is the world's largest spirits company. It's operating profit in excess of uh, 2,500 million in 2011. Scotch whisky exports generate about £110 per second uh, for the national economy. Uh, and look at where this growth uh, is, is happening and look at where uh, Diageo is targeting um, so uh, if the percentage of incremental increase in marketing spend, 72% increase in emerging markets. Emerging markets is, is the more polite way of saying developing countries uh, in this context. And Paul Walsh, the then CEO uh, of, uh, of Diageo, um, said that you know, now about 30% of the businesses in uh, developing countries and expect that to reach 50% very quickly. This receives unproblematic endorsement from the UK government. This is from a, a recent visit uh, from David Cameron um, to a distillery in Fife. Uh, note the particular brand of whiskey that he stands next to. Can you imagine him standing next to a packet of Etonian fags, for example? Um, I, th I think it's probably unlikely. Uh, but here, no, whiskey's a, an iconic product with a rich heritage and a fantastic future. It's truly a global brand. Uh, Diageo's president of global supply and procurement at the same meeting described the Cameron Bridge Distillery, uh, uh, where Cameron was opening... Uh, and, uh, an extension as the engine for growth of our Scotch whisky business and representing the investment we're putting into generating further export growth for our brands, further export growth being in developing countries. This is understandable in terms of straight economic logic. If you look at uh, the um, UK exports uh, of agri-food and drink by value, whisky's dominant, but we also have beer, wine and, uh, uh, and gin appearing fairly prominently uh, on the list, there's a fairly clear basic economic logic for David Cameron to do um, this sort of thing. Um, it, but I think it's important in terms of thinking about the UK as an actor in global health uh, to think about potential responsibilities that might be associated with this, particularly given the scale of the global expansion of the UK industry in recent years. So this, again, this isn't the clearest um, of slides, uh, but it, 
uh, generates a list of Diageo's key investments uh, in emerging markets in recent years, with a strong focus on China, on Africa, on India, as well as the Middle East, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Uh, I want to just quickly run through ways in which this has been actively promoted by um, the UK government. So firstly, we've had the government enabling uh, investment. Uh, so the Foreign Secretary, William Haig, uh, collaborated in assisting Diageo's purchase of a controlling stake in a Chinese brewer, um, at which point Paul Walsh declared his gratitude to the UK government for their strong support for our company as we've pursued this chance to grow our business in China. They've secured tariff, tariff reductions, reducing taxes. Um, so in 2010, Saab Miller sued the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh for unfair discrimination with the active support um, for the, from the UK government. So William Haig again says, our team worked closely with Saab Miller and local authorities in Andhra Pradesh to remove restrictive regulations prohibiting beer sales worth over $80 million in sales to that company, i.e. reducing the price of alcohol uh, in a state of India. Uh, it, no, it was a. It, it was a. I guess you know, India has had a protectionist market when it comes to um, uh, to alcohol. Uh, but one of the interesting things is the way in which protectionism can serve to advance public health interests, and so that you know, an attack on uh, what in uh, it, from a straight economic perspective looks like unfair practices is likely to have harmful consequences. Um, they've facilitated privatisation, um, so. Uh, Diageo supported, uh, sorry, the UK government supported Diageo's takeover uh, of Ethiopia's second largest beer company, um, supporting and guiding the company through the tendering process. Um, the, uh, uh, Diageo said that as a result of the support from the UK trade and industry, we were as prepared, well prepared as we possibly could be. We had access to decision makers, to opinion formers, and to a wealth of experience of doing business in Ethiopia. Now, all of the evidence suggests that privatisation uh, of uh, of state monopolies in alcohol is likely to lead to increased consumption in the same way as privatisation of state monopolies in tobacco have led to increased consumption. Um, the, we give access to development aid to alcohol companies. Um, so DFID has supported Diageo on using locally grown sorghum in its uh, beer brewing operations, giving matching funding of $250,000. Uh, in the Sudan, Saab Miller got nearly a million dollars uh, f to introduce local sourcing for cassava for its brewing operations. Now, Diffid's rationale makes kind of sense, even in, in terms of a development logic uh, of assisting small farmers to increase their yields and sell their crops. And if you look at the corporate social responsibility sections of alcohol company websites, that's the same kind of logic you see. But if you look at the investment sections of the company websites, if you look at the case they're making to shareholders, you see that rather we attract consumers by halving the price of beer. And investment in local grains, in sorghum, uh, in cassava, uh, the, the very things that are supported uh, by Diffid have served to reduce the price of these alternative forms of beer by 30%. That's been the result uh, of, of investment by, by Diffid. Uh, we've also challenged uh, regulations under WTO agreements, so various health policy measures uh, that have, um, have been introduced uh, around alcohol policy uh, 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 have been challenged. Um, the, the, the headline is a little misleading on this bottom one, Australia's double standards on Thailand's alcohol warning labels. Um, there was a, an article uh, suggesting that Australia was guilty of hypocrisy in uh, introducing plain packaging for, uh, for tobacco, um, but questioning the right of Thailand to introduce health warning labels uh, on, on alcohol. Now, Australia did raise a query, but it's the European Union that's going ahead and opposing um, Thailand's uh, measures there. Uh, and actively promoting um, industry interests in, in trade negotiations. This is an example of a trade agreement between the European Union uh, and South Korea. The biggest uh, objective of Spirits Europe and of the Scotch Whiskey Association is a free trade agreement with India. Um, India now being uh, the biggest market by volume for, um, for whiskey. Uh, and you know, that's expected um, to be finalized over the course of this year. So how can this be reconciled within the context of a coherent approach uh, to global health? Um, I think it's interesting, look, the development of uh, the UK's health as global strategy. So if we go back to the, uh, to the developmental stages, there was a recognition that, of course, there would be these tensions within strategies, that we do have to try and balance uh, economic objectives uh, with, with global health objectives. And, and this is a, 
um, a quote from, uh, from a discussion that was held in Edinburgh um, to inform the development of the strategy in which the, the challenge of alcohol um, interests was recognised uh, from the outset. Um, and if you look at the principles that underpin the strategy, again, um, they, they seem to be a, a, a quite a reasonable way uh, of recognising the tensions that are going to exist and to try to, uh, to think about ways of ordering them. So the, you know, the first principle is essentially first do no harm. Um, evaluate the impact of domestic and foreign policies uh, on global health, which seems like a, uh, a reasonable starting point. But if we look at how the strategy is developed, all of this recognition of potential for conflict of interest between national economic goals uh, and global health goals um, ha has pretty much dissipated. Um, so the most recent manifestation uh, of, uh, of the Health is Global strategy um, sets a list of 31 ways in which we'll make a difference in five years' time, 41 commitments that we will do good things. Um, and on alcohol, it essentially envisages no difference in five years' time, and there's no commitment that we will do anything at all um, on alcohol policy. If we look at national policies on, on alcohol, um, they're strikingly blind um, to the global context. So the word international and global don't appear at all in the English strategy um, for, uh, for alcohol. Uh, in Scotland, they exist only to provide reassurance that we will still actively promote the interests of the whisky industry um, overseas. We'll actively promote expansion uh, at a time when we're trying to introduce minimum pricing, etc. And again, I think this is different and importantly different to tobacco control. Uh, every national tobacco control strategy, this is the English example, but it could be any other, um, it is predicated in a recognition of the global challenges of tobacco control and of the significance of, uh, of tobacco as a, as a global epidemic um, and, and is replete with references to coordinated international action via the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. We also have some fairly specific measures um, which about three people know about, which, but which I think are interesting. And maybe they're more interesting uh, on the, the occasions when they're breached than, uh, than when they're respected. But there are government guidelines um, to prevent the UK government from, promoting, uh, from actively promoting the interests of tobacco overseas. So posts must no longer directly promote, promote products containing tobacco should recognise that the international tobacco um, lobbies are well organised, that posts shouldn't be um, associated in any way with the promotion of the tobacco industry. Very, very different language to that that exists in, um, in, in connection with alcohol. I think um, we need to, to rethink, um, and I'm getting towards the conclusion of what I'm going to say here, rethink this idea of tobacco being exceptional and that the lessons we... Uh, from tobacco control, I think, are more, more broadly applicable, or at least worth examining um, as, as broadly applicable than suggests here. That there's actually uh, a much broader divergence of interest between corporations and public health than, than for it, focusing attention on one particular bad industry suggests. Um, that there's substantial policy learning and collaboration across uh, industries, that um, food and alcohol companies have appropriated tobacco industry strategies, have learned from the tobacco industry playbook, um, uh, are, are desperate to avoid um, to, the tobacco control being presented as a precedent for other health issues. If you look at submissions by alcohol companies to consultations on the future of health strategy, they're full of don't treat us like tobacco. You know, it, it's, it's a core strategic um, objective and yet there are striking similarities in corporate strategies to undermine health policy. Different products, same strategies. Food and alcohol companies have both used strategies um, pioneered by the tobacco companies uh, to shape regulation. Strong focus on personal responsibility, claiming that government intervention infringes individual liberty, depiction of public health as the nanny state, etc, etc, etc. And food and alcohol companies have also collaborated um, with the tobacco industry, sharing youth marketing tactics, seeking to manage regulatory environment around impact <laughs> assessment, etc. Um, I think it's worth thinking about, and this is maybe slightly off the wall, uh, but one of my concerns about tobacco control is that it's sometimes that treating tobacco control as unique serves uh, to legitimate areas uh, of collaboration um, elsewhere. I think it's at least worth asking whether tobacco control has been parasitic on the unwillingness of policymakers to address um, other industries. Uh, that regulating uh, the tobacco industry uh, to the status of a pariah deflects attention from 
uh, a reluctance to challenge commercial sector interests more broadly. And I think this is relevant in a WHO context. I don't think it's a coincidence that Grow Harlem Brundtland, as Director General, launched the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control at the same time as she was opening up WHO to a much broader range of commercial sector collaborations as um, uh, 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 central to WHO strategies. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs um, got there first in terms of, uh, of this analysis, suggesting that it's, it's no coincidence that, um, that, that government ministers under attack in other areas choose to look to make progress in, uh, in tobacco control. So Andrew Lansley, at a time when you know, he's been depicted as tearing up the NHS and as handing over um, uh, responsibility for obesity and alcohol policy to the respective companies, um, was still nonetheless pushing very strongly for plain packaging at the time. Um, how would we take the, 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 what sort of policy agenda is um, implied by this? So firstly, I think we, we need to rethink the terms on which public health engages with corporations uh, and with government. Um, I think we need to question the presumption in favour of partnership. This isn't saying that there's no case for partnership, but we shouldn't start from a, uh, uh, from a basic assumption that, um, uh, that partnership is the default model, uh, as, as it is in most areas of public health. I think we need to recognise that there's, there's limited scope for collaboration where core economic interests uh, are challenged. Uh, and we should think about examining the wider applicability of Article 5.3 as a governance model. Um, there's an increasing interest uh, in uh, applying this um, to alcohol and to at least parts of the food industry, ultra-processed food industry, within, for example, the Lancer NCD Action Group. You know, should, uh, should other interests be excluded from, uh, from setting public health priorities? I think, you know, turning to the, the particular example that I focused on today on alcohol, uh, I think that there are some fairly um, basic steps that we could take towards promoting coherence between um, uh, understandable uh, economic goals uh, and global health objectives. The prerequisite for this is recognising um, the tensions between health, economic and trade objectives uh, as a starting point for, for identifying and managing them. Um, I think uh, we can take steps um, towards managing global harm by um, firstly, ensuring that alcohol policies um, at national level incorporate global dimensions. Health is never just uh, a domestic issue. Uh, I think it's worth thinking about guidelines to preclude active promotion of industry interests overseas. Should certainly be precluding um, alcohol companies from uh, receiving development assistance. Uh, I think we should be encouraging commitments not to challenge health policies within WTO and other contexts. Say, say Thailand's um, uh, provision for health, uh, uh, health information on, um, on labels was in contravention to, uh, to WTO requirements. There's nothing that says that the UK or the European Union has to challenge that. We could just accept that as a legitimate goal uh, for governments. Uh, and in developing bilateral trade agreements, like an a, a agreement between the European Union and India, uh, we shouldn't be leaving scope for investor state disputes, i.e. we shouldn't be making it easier for Saab Miller to sue um, uh, states in India um, uh, for breaching obligations. Thank you.